All right, this is Honors Algebra 2 Pre-Calc. Uh, we're doing 12.2 in Algebra 2, which is stem and leaf plots, histograms, and circle graphs. So this entire video is basically a lot of different ways to represent data. So let's jump right in. Uh, stem and leaf plots uh, are essentially very similar to uh, the grouped frequency charts that we saw in the last video. Um, the difference is that we're not just saying how often a particular type of number occurs, but we're actually giving the values, right? So if you look at this data set, there are a lot of two-digit numbers and there's some one-digit numbers. One way to group the data is to essentially group it by uh, the tens digit, right? So to say that uh, the numbers 5, 6, and 8 all are single-digit numbers, and you can see that up here, right? There's, there's 5 and 6 and 8. Those are the single-digit numbers, and they're right here, right? In order, with 5 being the smallest number in this entire data set. And then you could group all the numbers that have ones, uh, 1 as the tens digit, right? So 12, 14, 19, and 19 again, right? And that's, so the stem is the tens digit and the leaf is the ones digit. Now that's not always the way it's broken down. Uh, sometimes your stem is the number before the decimal and the leaf is the number after the decimal. Like uh, 1.2 could be a 1 and then a 2, 1 for the stem, 2 for the leaf. Sometimes you'll see that you have a big number like 123, and then there are actually two ways to do it, right? If you had the number 123, you might do a stem uh, and leaf plot where you used 120 as the stem and the 3 as the leaf. That would be useful if, let's say, a lot of your data was in the 120s, right? Like if you, uh, but but it's, it's you know, uh, kind of a weird choice, right? Um, so what would be more likely, so this is this would be uh, less useful, right? You could do it, but, but it would be less useful. What would be more useful is to have uh, hundreds and then you could have 23, right? Um, so it's, so I guess if a lot of your data were in the 120s, you could do it this way. Um, so maybe this is less useful, but if you had, uh, let's say you had a lot of data or maybe if all your data is in the hundreds, this would be useful, right? So, so if you had a bunch of data in the hundreds, right? Like a hundred, 115, 123, then it could be useful to say, okay, so here's 105 and here's a, a 113 and here's 123 and four and seven, right? Like. That could be useful, but the other way to write it, right? So you could either write this as a 12 slash 3, right? Or you could write it, let's say you have a lot of data in multiple hundreds. Well, you could do a 1 slash and then you could put a 23 because what if you also had 230 and 31 and etc., right? So there's different ways to do stem and leaf plots and, and which one you would pick would probably depend on the data you're handed. Um, but let's kind of walk through this, right? So, uh, oh, this can be kind of useful if the data were, um, let's say something like ages, right? Um, because you'd know that if you had a big long list of people in, let's say, the 40 section, that would mean, oh, hey, there's a lot of 40-year-olds here, right? Or there's, uh, if you had a really long list of people in the zero section, that would mean, oh, hey, this, whatever this is has a lot of kids, so we should, you know, take that into account when planning. So uh, speaking of which, let's do a problem that has ages. So Hogan is planning a post-COVID family gathering, totally safe after the virus is gone or handled or whatever, someday in the future, one can hope. Uh, so this is a list of, of ages of some people in my actual family at the time of filming. So we're going to make a stem and leaf plot for the ages. I'm going to point out that this is a bit tedious. You're going to find this in a lot of the videos in, in Chapter 12 of Algebra 2. This is stuff that there's a reason that Excel makes a lot of these graphs, right? So there's, this is not stuff you're going to do by hand often. It's one of the reasons I don't give you a test on this. So let's start uh, by looking at the ages. seems that I have ages starting at 2 and going as high as I see a 75, right? So it seems to me that it makes sense to use my stems as the tens digit, right? So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, right? And I don't end up needing that last spot. So when I do the leaf, right, so uh, I can pick any one of these uh, to be my key, right? You could just pick the first one. The first one, the lowest number is 2, right? So you could pick 0 slash 2 just equals 2 if you want. Um, or if you want to make it clearer, you could pick one that actually has both digits, right? It might be easier to pick, uh, let's pick 7 slash 5 means 75, just to make that really clear, right? So I put my key somewhere, and then I'm just going to go through and cross off my data. I do notice that I have 25 data pieces, right? Uh, so there's a couple ways to do this. Some people go through and try to find all the values in order, right? There's nothing wrong with that, uh, but I will say that it gets a little bit tedious. Another option is to just write the numbers in the spots as you go and leave a little bit of room. So for instance, I can guess that 40, so 41 is probably pretty close to the front of 40. So if I put it there, it's probably safe because in case there are some 40s, I can put them here. Uh, but 41 is a pretty low number, right? 36 is probably somewhere in the middle of the pack too because 36 is sort of in the middle of the 30s. Uh, 2 is the lowest number in the entire data set. So that's done. 
uh, nine, uh, and, and again, you might find it's easier to go and look for the single digits, right? It looks to me like the single digits are nines and sevens at this point. So you might just say, hey, cool, I can see those pretty quickly. Uh, I'm just going to do that, right? And that's fine. So, so that's okay if that's what you want to do, right? Um, again, if, if, so there's different schools of thought here, whether you kind of work your way through or whether you look for values. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and look some for some teens because the first way seems a little bit frustrating. So uh, I see a 13, 15, 17, 19, and another 13. So it looks to me like I have two 13s a 15, a 17, and a 19. So let's double check that. 13, 15, 17, 19, and that looks like that's all my ones digits. Uh, I don't think there's anyone who's 20 years old currently in my family at this exact moment, so we'll go ahead and skip that one. Uh, 30s, it seems that I see a 36, I already put there, but there's a 36, a 39, a, 30, uh, a 38, a 39, and a 35. So I've got a 35 separated by a comma from the six, and then an eight and a nine, and I think that's all of those values, right? Um, when we get to 40s, right, I seem to have, I have the 41 we already knew about, that one's done. Uh, it looks to me like when I go through this list, I have a 40, and there's the 41 I already knew about, uh, two 45s, a 47, and a 48, right? 45, 45. 47 and 48, and I think that's all of them. Cool. Uh, I don't seem to have any 50s, right? What seems to be left is a 68, a 72, and then some other 70 stuff. So I don't have any 50s. I have a 68. It's the only 60. And then it looks like I have two 70s, a 72, and a 75. So two 70s, uh, 72, and a 75. So let's do a quick count and see if we have, uh, if we have all of these numbers that we want to have, right? So I should have 25 total people, right? Uh, I have five listed here. I have one, two, three, four, five here. Uh, oh, and that 19 isn't a 19, right? It's a nine. Sorry. Hate the giant eraser. Sorry, just a nine. Okay. So um, so five and five would be 10. Uh, here I have a four and six terms. So that's another 10. So that's 20. And there's five. So I do have 25. So there's my stem and leaf plot. So yay. Congratulations. A is done. It was pretty tedious. I must have found the mean, median, and mode. So now I look at this data set and I see that there's a few numbers that occur twice. It doesn't look like there's any numbers that occur three times, right? So when I'm looking, uh, let's start with the mode because that's the easiest option. I see that the sevens here occur twice, so that, that's just seven by itself, so do the nines. Uh, 13 seems to occur twice, Fifth, uh, 45 seems to occur twice, and 70 seems to occur twice. So it seems to me that there are actually several mode values. Uh, and again, I didn't intentionally make you a data set that would work. I just used people's ages in my family. Uh, so looks to me that the mode is actually several different values. Remember, if, if a number occurs more than other numbers, then it's a mode, even if there's multiple in that situation. So it seems to me that 7 is a mode, so is 9. But then here, this isn't a 3, right? That's a 13 because it's got the stem of 1 and the 3. A uh, 45 and what seems to be a 70, right? So those seem to all be the mode. They all occur twice, right? So they occur the most, right? That's the mode. Um, and then I'm asked to find the median. So there are 25 data points. So the way you're going to find the median is um, since you know that there are 25 people, right? So there are 25 people. So person number 13 from either end, right? So from from either end is going to be the is going to be the median. So I'm just going to count in from from the first end. So 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12. I get that this is th that this is my median. I can check by counting in from the other side. I should also get that that's the 13th person. 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12. Hey, look, 13. So the median is 38. Okay, so I have a mode and a median. Again, I know that's a little bit tedious. Uh, I didn't ask you to find the mean. You could, but it wasn't. There's no shortcut to finding the mean on a table like this, and, and that's a lot of numbers. All right, so you're going to go ahead and give this a try. You're going to make a stem and leaf plot uh, with the data uh, here, right? You're going to find the median and the mode, and then uh, the question is how many values fall between 5 and 6, right? So they just want you to, to count that out. So notice that here, right, it's going to make sense for me to use uh, the decimal as the logical split, right? So I seem to see things that start with 2, and three, um, four, I see things that start with four, five, six, seven, 
don't see anything that starts with eight, but I can still put that on my table. I do see stuff that starts with nine. So I don't see anything that starts with one at all. So I'm going to say two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, right? Uh, I'm going to pick any number on here for my key, right? I'm going to argue that the easiest thing is to probably do what we figured out after trying a little bit trial and error at the beginning, which is look through and try to find the lowest numbers that you can and then try and get all the twos. So I'm going to work my way across. I see that I have a 2.5 a 2.3, another 2.3, and another 2.3. And I think that's all the twos, right? So I think I have 2.3, 2.3, 2.3, and 2.5. I'm just going to use that 2.3 as my key. Uh, so 2 slash 3 is equal to a 2.3, just like over here in the key. So those all seem to be done, right? Now I'm going to look for threes. So I have a 3.3, and then two 3.2s. So I have 3.2, 3.2, 3.3. I'm going to look for fours. I see a 4.2, another 4.2. I have a 4.5 twice, and that seems to be it. So 4.2, 4.2, 4.5, and 4.5. 2, 2, 5, and 5, right? Now I'm going to look for fives. So I have a 5.5, 5.3, 5.6, 5.7, 5.8, 5.9, 5.10, 5.11, 5.12, 5.13, 5.14, 5.15, 5.16, 5.17, 5.18, 5.19, 5.20, 5.21, 5.22, 5.23
four. There are two five sixes, that's the issue. Okay, there we have it. So this is still the 14th term. So that was frustrating, but that's what it is. There's a, there's a six missing, silly five six is missing. So uh, that means that my median is a 50, or sorry, a 5.4, right? And then I was asked how many data points fall between six and five, right? Uh, so between six and five would be these guys right here, right? So the answer is one, two, three, four, five, six. So six out of 27 fall uh, between uh, 5.0 and 6.0, right? Um, and we're asked to sort of describe the shape of the distribution. I mean, you could kind of describe this as a little bit of a bell curve, right? It's a bigger bump in the middle and then kind of levels out. So you could kind of say it's a bit of a bell curve. Uh, so I'm just going to say bell curve-ish. Close enough, right? All right. So let's talk about histograms. So a histogram is basically a bar graph that uh, gives the frequency of each value. So in a histogram, we use the horizontal axis uh, as uh, basically... Uh, instead of using it as hash marks where the hash mark itself stands for a number, it's divided into widths like a, a bar graph would be. Uh, and you'll see that again in, in just a second when I give you a picture. And then we use the y-axis to represent the frequency of each value at the bottom, right? So uh, you ask everyone you know to choose their fave Harry Potter book. Uh, you only know people who have a fave Harry Potter book, uh, naturally. And, and you also uh, intentionally only pick people uh, that will not argue with you about picking two books because it's hard to pick a favorite sometimes. So uh, so there are seven Harry Potter books, so we're going to go ahead and make uh, tallies. So again, it's not a bad idea to know ahead of time how many people you've asked. So this is five rows across and six rows down. That's 30 people, and, and you can see that I put that down here as well. So when we're tallying, we should double check that we get 30. So the nice thing about a tally mark is we just have to cross it off as we, as we get to it, right? So I've got a one, uh, a seven, a two, and then two threes, right? And I'm going to cross off that row because it makes my life easier. Uh, I've got a one... Uh, a five, a six, a seven, and a six. That's this row, right? Uh, I've got a three. I've got one. I've got six. I've got seven, and I've got another three. Okay, that's this row. Uh, I have a four. Somebody finally given the Goblet of Fire a little bit of love. I got a seven, another seven, a six, and a one, right? I've got a four. I've got, I finally, uh, I got a, uh, another three, so it's another Azkaban and then another one, right? And then two more sixes, so here and here, okay? And then uh, seven's finished and strong in the last row. We've got seven, seven, five, seven, seven. Wow, so last row came out strong. All right, so let's double check that we get to 30, right? Um, so this is four plus one, which would be five, uh, plus six, right, is 11, plus 2 is 13, plus 2 again is 15, uh, plus 6 should be 21, and then 9 is 30. Hey, so that works out. Okay, so uh, so 7 uh, wins, right? And I think that's it's arguable. I'm going to argue that me personally, I think that uh, I think that 3, 6, and 7 are the strongest entries in the series, uh, but I have a special spot in my heart for 1, uh, just because it introduces you to uh, Harry Potter uh, in general. Uh, I don't care for five. I found Order of the Phoenix to be the worst, but you're welcome to your opinion. Uh, so anyway, uh, let's go ahead and draw our histogram. So histogram uh, of favorite Harry Potter books. So on the bottom, you see how the numbers aren't actually at the edges. They're not on the line. The numbers are between the line. So because each, each of these columns represents the actual book. So I'm going to go up to four, uh, and I didn't actually give myself enough room to do the entire histogram. Uh, because I didn't give myself space to go up to nine because I did not realize I'd given seven that many votes. So I'm just going to alternate colors so it's a little bit easier to see. Uh, so for the second book, right, the second book only got one, so we'll do that, right? And then uh, Azkaban got six, so we'll go up to six. And again, uh, forgive my inability to draw things, right? Um, and then Goblet of Fire got two. Right, and uh, we'll go back to green. Uh, Order of the Phoenix got two. And Half-Blood Prince got six. Right, and then coming in strong at the end, in fact, strong enough that I did not allot enough space on our bar graph uh, for our histogram, so we'll notch it up to nine. Oops, uh, is Deathly Hallows. Cool. 
So that's what a histogram is. It's just a bar graph that indicates frequency. That's it. So, so this is basically the book number, right? It's not, uh, not how many of something. It's literally physically the book number, right? Uh, which I tried to indicate by saying the names of the books. Uh, and then this is the frequency. But just saying the word histogram explains that this axis is frequency, right? That's what a histogram is. Okay, cool. All right, so no Harry Potter, just a bunch of numbers this time. So we're going to go ahead and make a frequency table uh, and then a histogram for this, right? So uh, 11, 12, 16 gets to 12, 16, 15, 11, 15, 14, 13, 12. That's the whole first row. Uh, 17, 15, 17, 17. 13, mine was much more fun, 14, 13, 11, 13, 12, 15, 13, 15. Okay, so let's double check that the numbers add up, right? 3 plus 4 is 7, plus 5 is 12, plus 2 is 14, plus 5 is 19, plus 3 would be 22 plus 2 is 24. So that checks out. And then when I make my histogram of whatever the data set is, right, so this side is automatically frequency. And this side is literally just numbers. I don't, I don't know what it is. They didn't, I didn't, you know, I just gave you a number set. So, uh, so uh, the number 11 occurs three times. So up to three, make a bar graph, right? Uh, the number 12 occurs four times. So up to four, you don't have to color it in. I just was trying to make it prettier for you. Um, the number 13 occurs five times. The number 14 occurs twice. Uh, 15 occurs five times. No real logic to the color order here. Uh, the number 16 occurs three times. And the number 17 occurs twice. And that's it. All right, so uh, relative frequency tables include an extra column that puts the frequency over the total number of data points. So this is essentially uh, about probability. This is how frequently the value appears relative to the entire set. So for instance, if we go back up to my Harry Potter example, right, um, we pulled 30 people, right? Out of the 30 people polled, uh, only one out of the 30 picked Chamber of Secrets, right? So, so there's a one in 30 chance that someone was going to pick Chamber of Secrets, but there was a nine in 30 chance, right? Uh, which is the same as three tenths or 30% chance that someone was going to pick uh, Deathly Hallows, right? So that's, that's the idea, right? So, uh, so when we go ahead and do this, right, we're going to go back to the Harry Potter list and I'm going to uh, take this, uh, just going to take a quick shot of this so that we're not miserably trying to remember what the values were, right? So we'll just drag this on here. Hey, look, we're cheating. It's totally awesome. <laughs> All right. Hey, it's, it's going to work. Uh, kind of. Didn't entirely work, but we'll, okay. We'll do this. That's better. All right. So, uh, so we're going to go ahead and just copy the, these values, right? So it's uh, 4, 1, 6, 2, 2, 6, 9, right? So essentially all the relative frequency is, is, uh, is this number over the total, which is 30, right? So 4 over 30, which will get an approximate percentage for 1 over 30, which will get an approximate percentage for uh, 6 over 30, uh, which I don't actually have to get an approximate percentage for because that's 1 fifth, so that's 20%. Uh, 2 over 30, which will get an approximate percentage for another 2 over 30, which will get an approximate percentage for uh, a 6 over 30, which we've already established was a 20%. Uh, and then a 9 over 30, which I know is 3 over 10. Uh, so that is definitely uh, going to be another 30% like we discussed. So I can find the other ones by putting them in my calculator, right? So 4, uh, sorry, the calculator is a little bit slow. 4 divided by 30. Hit enter. So this is a 13.3 uh, uh, repeating percent, right? Uh, 1 divided by 30 which is going to be a 3.3 uh, repeating percent, right? Uh, 2 divided by 30 would just be double that, right? So it, so it should be, uh, I can just be lazy and multiply by 2, but it should be a 6.6 .6 repeating percent chance. So 6.6 .6 repeating 
All right, so those are the percent chances, and obviously you have 100% chance 30 out of 30 is 100, because uh, basically 30 out of 30 would be the odds that someone said a Harry Potter book, and since you only asked friends that read Harry Potter or chose one, everyone had to choose it by default, it's 100%. So, um, so then I asked you to make, uh, so make a relative frequency table and then use that to estimate how likely it is that someone chose the first three books. So, so one of the first three books. Well, well that would be a 13.3% plus a 3.3 uh, repeating percent plus a 20%, right? Uh, so that should be a 36.6% chance, uh, uh, sorry, 36.6 repeating percent chance uh, that they chose either uh, Sorcerer's Stone, uh, Chamber of Secrets, uh, or Azkaban. So it's the 36.6% chance that they chose one of those three. All right, so uh, P2, let's revisit the data from P2. Again, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel here. We'll just go ahead and drag this data over by screenshot, because why would we want to reinvent this? So, uh, so three, four, five, two, five, three, and two, right? And then we're going to go ahead and find uh, the relative frequency, right? So again, your relative frequency is just uh, this number over the total 24. So three, oh, my bad. Right, so this is going to be three over 24, and you can find that as an approximate percentage. Uh, four over 24, which we can find as an approximate percentage. Uh, this is one eighth, so that's 12.5 percent. I'm just going to go ahead and get ahead of that. Uh, five over 24, which we can find in a sec. Two over 24. Uh, one sixth would be a 16.6 percent chance because it's half of a third. Uh, one twelfth would be half of that, so it should be, I think, an 8.3 repeating percent chance. We'll double check in the calculator in a sec. Uh, five twenty-fourths we'll find in a second. Uh, three twenty-fourths we already established is one eighth, so that's going to be a 12.5 percent chance. Uh, and then two twenty-fourths again should be one twelfth, uh, so it should essentially be uh, a six divided. Uh, should be uh, a six divided by. Two, which is uh, the 8.3 repeating, I believe, but we'll double check. So, uh, so let's do five uh, divided by 24 first, because that was the only one I couldn't make a decent uh, thought of in my head. So this is a 20.83, and the, the three only is repeating, not the eight, right? Um, and then let's just double check that I'm not wrong about some stuff. So let's double check three divided by 24. Yep, that's 12.5. Let's check four divided by 24. Yep, that's 16.6 repeating. Let's check 2 divided by 24. Yep, 8.3. So those are my percentages. And then the question is, uh, estimate the probability that the number, uh, a number drawn at random from this set is 15 or higher. Well, these are the numbers that are 15 or higher, right? So that would be uh, essentially this 8.3 repeating percent, right? So, uh, so essentially it would be uh, or the other way to do it is to look at it, it would be 5 and 3 and 2, all of those values. Uh, so that would be 10 out of 24, right? If you add those values together, uh, you would get 10 divided by 24, which should be double the one that's a 5. So it should be like a 41 point, oh, sorry, uh, 10 divided by 24. Uh, it should be double of the 20.83, so it should be something like a 41.6 repeating is what I guess, but I'm not entirely sure. Hey, there it is. All right. So, um, so if you add all of these together, right? If you added the twenty point eight three repeating plus the twelve point five plus the eight point three repeating, uh, you would get that this is a forty one point six percent repeating, right? The six is repeating. All right. So, uh, last thing. Let's talk about circle graphs. So, circle graphs are a visual way to represent data um, from relative frequency charts. To make a circle graph, you basically add a column onto that relative frequency table. Uh, that includes the degrees in the circle. Uh, since a circle has 360 degrees, you multiply the percentage by the number of degrees in a circle by 360. So for example, if we go back to the Harry Potter example, uh, this, uh, this, the number three, right, the number of people that chose the prisoner of Azkaban, um, that would be 20% of the circle. So it would be the 360 
times 20%, right? Or 360 divided by five, which would be a 72. So I would use 72 degrees. So that's basically what's gonna happen. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna not use the Harry Potter example, but we're gonna go ahead and, and walk through uh, making an example of this, right? So, so basically what's gonna happen here is I'm gonna add a relative uh, frequency section, right? And so that relative frequency is gonna be whatever number uh, chose, for instance, in this case, cooking or electrical or unknown, uh, et cetera over the total of the 1200 people that asked, right? That's the relative frequency. And then from that relative frequency, I'm gonna multiply that by 360 to find the number of degrees, right? So uh, this would be 1200 out of 1200. And then I'm gonna go ahead and multiply to get the degrees. And then we're gonna try really hard to draw this with a protractor, which is gonna be super duper fun. And I am very much being sarcastic when I say that, uh, but we're just gonna walk through it. I'm never, ever, ever gonna make you draw a circle graph by hand. Uh, but I want to just walk you through how they work and, and what they're made of. Uh, so anyway, so uh, the total degrees in a circle is 360, right? So basically what I'm going to do, I have a 312 over the 1200 as the relative frequency. I have a 216 over the 1200. I have a 60 over the 1200, another 60 over 1200, a 120 over 1200. That one's at least nice. Uh, and a 168 over 1200. So basically to get the number of degrees, I'm gonna take this number times the 360 degrees to get the number of degrees. So um, let's go ahead and walk through this. Uh, I'm gonna be a little bit lazy here. So I'm tired of typing this in my calculator. So here's what I'm gonna do. Um, I'm, I'm gonna say that it's some number over 1200 times 360. So here's what I'm gonna type in my calculator. I'm gonna type 360 over 1200 times X, and then I'm just gonna change with the X is a bunch because I'm lazy and that's easier. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna type in that I want 360, uh, and if you want, you don't have to switch the order. You can literally make this X, the number we don't know. So if, if, if that makes you feel uncomfortable doing what I did, you can type X over 1200, meaning X is this number, and right? I'm gonna call this X just to make my life easier. This is one of those like math life hacks times 360. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to table set and I'm just going to jump to the number I want. I want 264. And I, I can go by ones. It doesn't really matter. I'm not going to be changing my table in particular. I'm going to go by ones. Uh, sorry, I went down too many. Silly calculator is all glitchy and frozen. Okay. So uh, I'm going to go by ones. Here you go, calculator. That's it. Okay. So if I go to table, it's going to give me the 264, and that's a 79.2. So I say, cool, 79. Uh, and, and I could check for more details. Like, I could scroll over. If I go over, it'll give me more details if there are more. In this case, there aren't, so it's just 79.2. Uh, then I'm going to go back to table set, and I'm picking, the, I'm picking the 312. Now, there's other options, but really, this is a pretty quick alternative uh, to not feeling like plugging in a bunch of stuff. So I get a 93.6 degrees, right? So this is how many degrees I'm gonna use. Uh, I'm gonna go back to table set. I'm gonna pick a 216. Go back to table. It's gonna be the top number. Cool, that's a 64.8 degrees, right? Uh, 60 over the, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, the 60 occurs twice, which is nice so I can bust that out. Um, you could also probably figure this one out logically because it's an easy number relative to the 1200, right? So this is 18 degrees. This is also 18 degrees. Um, this is definitely a one tenth. 120 over uh, the 1200 is definitely one tenth. So this is going to be 36 degrees. Um, but uh, sorry, I didn't mean 30, 360. I meant 36. There we go. Um, and that's fine. If you need to type it in, you certainly could. And then the last one's the 168. So I'm going to go back to my table set and do 168. I don't care what me what method you use. You're not doing this by hand. There's no way you're you know spending the time to find these numbers by hand. So given that you're not finding them by hand, uh, you might as well just find a good fast life uh, like sort of life hack hack way to do it in the calculator. So now we're going to draw this. We're not going to spend a ton of time on it. It already feels like we've spent a lot of time. Here's how you do it. Yeah, you, you draw a circle. You draw one radius, preferably uh, horizontal. Sorry, didn't mean to make that giant. Okay. So then you're going to line this center thing up on that line, right? And what you're going to do, and we'll see, I think it actually might let me do it. Let's, uh, I'm experimenting with this, honestly, for a bit the first time, like kind of the first time. So I think if I do this, uh, hang on, I think if I grab this, I can take it up to, I want to go to, so it doesn't matter how you do it. I'm, I'm going to go up to the seven, uh, the 79.2, right? You can do it this way. Honestly, if you were doing it on paper, so, um, 
it's a little hard to see, but uh, so there's 50, 60, 70, 79.2 is darn close to 80. It's going to be about there, right? Um, and then I think, I think it actually sets it for me if I do this, maybe. Close. I don't want it to, um, so that was close to 79.2. If I do this, it actually gives me the angle. Now, that's fine, uh, but what's annoying about it is that I want it to be centered, right? I want it to be centered a little bit better. So that's that would be the first section of my circle graph. Um, in this case, you can you can actually use this protractor to do that. If you were doing it by hand, that's not what you would do, right? Um, if you were doing this by hand, oh, not what I meant. Oh, well, we'll figure it out. So if you were doing this by hand, uh, nobody wants that. There it is. Okay. So what you're going to do is you line up on the next spot, right? The spot that you just got, you line that up. And then, so I did the 79.2, right? I did this guy. Now I want a 96 point three or 93.6, which is basically a 94. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to go here. I'm going to try and drag this guy. If it'll let me, it's being quite stubborn. Not what I want. That's what we want. Come on. Okay. Let's shrink it a little to see if it'll let me do it. Okay. So it's being incredibly stubborn. I apologize, guys. Uh, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to, using a regular protractor, in fact, that's how we're going to do it because I'm kind of over this thing, to be honest. Using a regular protractor, what I would do is, and we'll use black for this, I would measure from this line and I would go to where 94 is. So here's 90. This is probably 94, right? So that's right about there is where I would draw my line. So then I'm going to move this guy for a sec. My line would be somewhere around here. And yeah, that's not perfect, but you get the gist. So, so we have the first section. This is my 94 degrees, right? That's the next section from that 94, right? So now I'm going to take this thing. Again, we want to make sure that we center uh, things on this line, and that's not perfect, but you get the gist. From the 94, now I want a 64, right? So again, if I don't have the, the fancy protractor, like this thing is annoying and I can't get it to move anyway. So if I don't have that thing, uh, I'm going to start here and I'm going to go, so there's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. I want 64-ish, so that's somewhere around here. Perfect. It's not clo it's not exactly right, but it's fine. So that's my next one, right? That's my 64. Then I need a couple 18s. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate this thing again. Again, it would be much easier if this were a regular protractor in the real world, but it is what it is. So I rotate it again, and now I want to rotate so it lines up on that line and so that that point is still at the center. I need two 18s, so honestly, I'm going to bust out both 18s real fast. I'm going to say, hey, there's an 18, right, around there. And then here's 32, uh, there's 36. So that's probably about the other 18. So I'm just going to bust both of those out right now. So, so there's my first 18. Oh, wait, sorry, it's doing an annoying thing. So there's my first 18. It's not perfect. There's my other 18, right? So both 18s are done. Now I need a 36. And again, I get that this is tedious if you've completely checked out and you were like, cool, Hogan, so I'm never doing this by hand. I can't blame you. That's fine. So I need a 36. So uh, again, I line this up with the last line. I count out to, there's my 30. So there's about 36. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? And then I move this guy out of the way. And so you'll notice the 36 is about twice as big as the 18s because it should be, right? And then the last one I should get is about a 50.4. And if I did my job right, then this is close enough to a 50.4. Nobody's going to judge if it's not perfect. Uh, so sure enough, we line up here. Yep, that's about right. It's a little bit high, right? It's a little bit high. So it means that one of my angles is slightly off, but I'll take it. And then once you're done, uh, you're usually going to end up color coding, right? You'll say something like, hey, cooking, this is cooking, right? And you'll, you'll color code it on your pretty graph. And then you'll say uh, something like, hey, here's neon green for electrical, right? Um, and then this will be your neon green, right? And that's how you'd make your circle graph. I'm just way too lazy to do this. So uh, you might say something like, unknown is purple. That's really vague and makes me nervous that that many house fires are called, caused by unknown things. Uh, and then maybe you'll say something like children can be this little section right here. It's a surprisingly small number given how dangerous children can be. Uh, and I don't know, maybe we'll use seafoam green for one, right? So open flames, very enthusiastic seafoam green, right? Um, and then that's probably like a periwinkle. Let's see. All right. So we'll use uh, smoking can be this color, right? And that's kind of the idea, right? So you're going to color code your terrible much nicer than my circle graph circle graph. So I am going to walk you through this tedious process uh, one more time, right? Uh, so that would be the last one, right? And I'd color code it on my circle graph. And then you'd have a key that labels them, but I'm way too lazy for that after we worked this hard to get here. So 
Um, I'm going to do this one more time on a practice problem. Uh, the good news about this one is it's only four items, uh, which is helpful, right? Uh, I do need to, in this case, find out what the total number of items are because I wasn't given that as a choice, right? So I am going to have to find the total. It's going to be 891 uh, plus 627 plus 235 plus 122. Be nice if they gave me a nice number. It's not the best number, but uh, it's not awful. So, so my total number is the 1875, right? Um, so basically, to find my number of degrees, right? So if we wanted the relative frequency, it's going to be this number, right? So the 891 divided by the 1875, right? And then the 627 divided by the 1875, and the 235 divided by the 1875 and the 122 divided by the 1875. Um, and then to find my degrees, right, which I'll do here because I'm going to move this guy up a little bit, right, if we want to find our degrees. Again, I will never make you do this by hand. I just want you to get the logic of how it works. You can totally skip the rest of this video if you are over it. So, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and find whatever uh, this number is uh, times, so, so essentially I'm just going to do that same thing I did before where I cheat and I say, cool, so I'm going to say that x over 8 75 times 360 is my number of degrees, right? Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and do that in my calculator and just plug in those values, right? So, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and change this to an X. And instead of being a 1200, we're going to change it to, if the calculator would scroll fast enough that it's not making my head explode, we will change it to an 8, 7, and a 5. Oh, it did not scroll fast enough to not make my head explode, explode, and this is where we're at now. Cool, we're just going to clear the whole thing because it's frustrating. X divided by 1875 times 360. Cool. Then we're going to go to table set. I'm going to go ahead and type in the 891 and go to table. Cool. So I get that this is uh, a 1... 71.07 degrees, but honestly, I could probably just say 171 because there's no way you're graphing more accurately than that uh, by hand, right? If it's a calculator, different story, but if you're graphing by hand, let's be reasonable, you know, it's hard enough to graph closer than, it's hard enough to get 170, right? Uh, so 627, and then I go back to my table, eventually, and I get about a buck 20, right? So again, I, I wouldn't stress it too much because if you're actually graphing this by hand, uh, you're not going to be able to be that much more accurate. Uh, 235. And I get about 45 degrees. And again, that's, you know, approximate. So we'll say approximate degrees. Uh, and then back to my table, and I need the 122. And arguably, you don't need the 122 because you should be able to figure out um, by default that it's whatever's left, right? But we're just going to go ahead and say that's close enough, right? So if I were going to sketch this graph, um, what I'd have to do, and we'll see if we can uh, drag this guy down here again for a sec. I think that's a better spot for it. So again, you start with a line. Usually, uh, it's usually sort of uh, horizontal in the direction of the positive x-axis. I hate this thing so much. There we go. Okay, so uh, we're going to turn it, and we want to line it up so that this line is right at the center of the circle, or so that this dot's at the center of the circle and this along the line, right? Uh, and then I'm going to make this one a little smaller because I need to be able to see the edge. So the other thing you can do, honestly, if you don't want to move the protractor a ton of times, is you can just add, right? You can say, okay, I want to go to 171, right? Well, this is 90, this is a buck 80, so this is 171, right? And then if, if, if it hadn't been this far, you could have just actually added uh, and said, okay, what would be the next thing on the protractor? Now here, because it is uh, this far, right? Uh, we want, I think it's here if I wanted to rotate. There we go. So I'm just going to cheat and line up with that line. I know that line's my first one. For after the 171, I want a 120. Well, this is 90, 100, 110, 120. So that's, that's my 120, right? And then, again, I'm going to cheat and rotate. And from that line where the 120 is, I want a 45 and a 23. Well, there's 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's about my 45 and my 23. And it's not perfect, but you get the gist. Again, this is definitely not the best, uh, the best circle graph you've ever seen, but it's also not the worst thing that's ever happened. So, uh, so we'll do something akin to like about there. Cool. And then if I were color coding this, right, I'd say, hey, liberal arts, you get to be this giant section here. And we'll make natural sciences this big section here. 
and we'll make undecided this section, and we'll make other this section. And that's what circle graphs look like. So um, that's kind of the gist of how a circle graph works. Um, so yeah, uh, personally, my very favorite per circle graph looks something like this. It's this, right? And, uh, and let's say this. And the color coding is something like Pac-Man, not Pac-Man. So there you go, favorite circle graph. Uh, and that's it for this video.